When I was in seminary in North Carolina, uh, one of the roles that I had, I don't even know how I ended up with this, uh, but one of the roles that I had that um, I got paid for, actually, is the seminary is located about uh, 30 minutes from the airport. And so I served in this capacity where I was assigned to go pick up at the airport um, speakers that would speak um, in the chapel services in the seminary. So it was probably a pretty cool opportunity for a dude in his 20s and young and um, learning and in ministry. And so I got to, to talk and spend some time with some, you know, pretty known speakers at the time. And I picked up this one guy at the airport and brought him back to the seminary to speak and then drove him back to the airport um, after he was done. And at the time, this guy was kind of known for some like marriage books he had written, some relational type books. But in the midst of our conversation, um, he said to me, hey, Devin, I'm writing this uh, fiction book on the end times. I have no idea how it's going to go, but um, I'd like to send you an advanced copy if you want it. I know you're a young student, don't have a lot of money, and I know you want books, and so I'll send you one. So he got my address, and um, sure enough, a few weeks later, um, a book arrived in the mail. It's actually this book right here, um, and it is the book called Left Behind. And the guy that was writing with me is Tim, was Tim LaHaye, um, and he signed it and wrote a note in here and all those things. It was like a first edition Left Behind book. Is anybody familiar with this? Most of you, okay? So Left Behind ended up, and again, this is not a theology book. I need to say that again loudly. This is not a theology book. Uh, this is a fiction book um, written about what he believed, his interpretation of the end time. So this book became 16 books in the Left Behind series, um, four different, I guess, Hollywood-produced movies, um, some that had Kurt Cameron in them, and then the last one had... Nick Cage. Anybody watch that dreadful movie? Nicolas Cage starred in the remake of Left Behind. It became an audio drama, a PC game. It had several sequels. Long story short, Left Behind series, franchise, has grossed over $100 million. There's big bucks in end times material, right? If you don't believe that, there are YouTubers who are cashing in, making bank, just putting out their interpretation of end times videos. Hundreds and thousands and millions of people flock to YouTube to learn the latest and greatest about end times prophecy or teaching, most of the time not even knowing who really who they're listening to. And these YouTubers are making a lot of money with sensational headlines about end times events. And I'm not sure that this is what Jesus had in mind in Mark chapter 13. Mark 13, we learned last week, is what most New Testament scholars call the Olivet Discourse. Jesus taught these things from the Mount of Olives. It is his longest and most complex teaching in the Gospel of Mark. And his subject is the end times. His subject is uh, what is referred to in theology terms as eschatology. There is a lot of speculation concerning the events that Jesus describes in these chapters. A lot of speculation about how these things are fulfilled, when they are fulfilled. Every time it seems like there's some world-known catastrophe that happens. If it's an earthquake in Turkey or a tsunami in some um, Asian island or something, there's a lot of speculation that's built around those events to say the end is here, right? Look out for the mark of the beast. It's around the corner. Anytime things like that happen, It's a lot of what and who. And this is the exact same question the disciples were asking. What is going to take place? When are these things going to happen? Have these things, now in this this day and age, have these things already happened? Some of the things Jesus talks about in this chapter, are they things that have not yet happened? 
And the answer to those questions is kind of a mix. Like, yes, there are some things that have happened and seems to be some things that have not yet happened. Let me give you some important eschatology, interpreting apocalyptic literature 101 when it comes to understanding, reading, trying to interpret biblical prophecy. Just a couple of things to keep in mind, okay, to kind of lay some groundwork here. Um, Anytime we're talking about biblical prophecies in the Scripture in particular, um, we have to remember that not everything that is in this kind of genre of Scripture is laid out in just kind of chronological sequence, in chronological order, like this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens. What is certain is that when Jesus speaks these words, that they are words that he talks about, things that will happen in the future from Jesus, okay? So when Jesus speaks, the things he's talking about are future things. What is not certain is how many of those things have been completely fulfilled and how many of those things are still to come. So that's very important when you're reading biblical prophecies like Mark 13. We also have to remember that prophecies are often fulfilled in stages, that there are things that are partially fulfilled. We said last week the fall of Jerusalem was right around the corner. The destruction of the Jerusalem temple was right around the corner when Jesus spoke these words. So there was some partial fulfillment of things that were about to come in the next few decades of time. And then there's also complete fulfillment, that those partial fulfillments are often pointing ahead to future fulfillment, more complete fulfillment that will happen in what we traditionally call the end of time. End time, second coming of Christ. We hear a lot of phrases around that. And so what we have to keep in mind is we seek to understand this kind of apocalyptic um, end times literature in the Scriptures that when we are interpreting, reading, seeking to understand these things, that primarily we must understand them first and foremost in their original context. Like, who was Jesus talking to when he said these things? Who is his most immediate audience? And that's what's most important when interpreting the text. First and foremost, why was this passage written? To whom was it written? Why was it written to them? That's the primary audience. And then we are kind of this secondary audience, the everyone else, the future audience. So I say all those things to say this. As we are unpacking passages like Mark 13, we could go, there's a lot of apocalyptic literature throughout all of Scripture, right? And so if we were to go to any of these texts, I would say that we have to approach them with a lot of caution and a lot of humility. And so we enter into these conversations and trying to unpack what Jesus is saying, recognizing that we don't fully grasp everything Jesus is talking about here, that we can try to make some connection points and understand that in God's timing, these things will come to full fruition, but we do so with with caution and humility. Last week, we looked at the first 13 verses in Mark 13, and I told you that they seemed to point to what was in the immediate future for the disciples. Around 70 AD, there's this Roman emperor named Titus that comes in and, and just levels Jerusalem. Uh, the Jewish wars are recorded in Jewish history and uh, records a lot of this. And so the, around 70 AD, there's this massacre that takes place in Jerusalem uh, the, the temple is completely destroyed. We see a lot of these things fulfilled in the book of Acts as far as what Jesus is prophesying here. But we also said that these verses are also pointing forward to what we would term the second coming when these prophecies will be more fully fulfilled. So that was the first 13. The verses, as you could tell, that Suzanne just read, they get even more cryptic, right? What is going on here? So let's dive in, we'll walk through these verses with caution, and again, keeping these things in mind about partial fulfillment and complete fulfillment and entering the text with a lot of humility. So uh, verse 14 of chapter 13 is where we pick up in our uh, text today, and we immediately have this phrase that kind of stands out. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, And then there's a parenthesis here, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down or enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak, right? So there's a lot of urgency going on here. And alas, for women who are pregnant 
For those who are nursing infants in those days, <coughs> pray that it may not happen in the winter. So again, some cryptic verses here trying to understand what's going on. Uh, Jesus says when you, back in verse 7, he said when you hear these things. In verse 14, he says when you see these things. Okay, so there's some hints here. Now when Jesus is saying you're going to hear them, you're going to see them, that at least some of this is going to be fulfilled in the lives and the time of the disciples. It hints at something that's going on in the immediate future. And we do believe that these things were partially fulfilled in the very near future. Again, I told you, like just a few years from Jerusalem being destroyed. And Jesus speaks with urgency here. When you see these things happening, like don't even take time to go back inside and, and grab your overnight bag. Like you just flee and get out of there because destruction is coming. Now, what about this phrase, the abomination of desolation? Almost sounds like the I don't know, a Lord of the Rings sequel or something, right? The Abomination of, of, of Desolation. Um, and if you watch the Lord of the Rings sequels, there was one that even, I think, had the idea of desolation. Not the best one in the series, uh, but this, what is this phrase all about? Well, this phrase is taken from the Old Testament book of Daniel, and it refers to a scandalous act of sacrilegious defilement of the temple. Now, the original use in the book of Daniel, most Old Testament scholars believe was referring to an incident in Jewish history that happened about 168 before Christ. So, you know, about 170 years before Jesus would have spoken these words. And it was during that time that there was a Syrian general. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. Feel free to name your next child that. Welcome to the world, Antiochus Epiphanes. And by the way, this Antiochus Epiphanes was the fourth so that means three sets of parents before number four decided to roll with that name, Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth, right? So you could just be a bridge builder, you could just be a trendsetter. You can have Antiochus Epiphanes Hudson the first. There's no, there's no Hudson kid coming, by the way. <laughs> there's nothing subtle about that right there. Now, I'm, not, I'm not dropping any hints there. No Hudson. There's no Antiochus Epiphanes coming for sure. The fourth. And what happened with this Syrian general is an, a, an act to blaspheme the God of the Jews. He set up an altar, erected an altar to Zeus in the temple, and he sacrificed a pig on the altar of burnt offering. An act of utter blasphemy against the Jews and their God, right? Gives a whole different idea of the phrase, sui, right? Sacrificed a pig in the Holy of Holies. And so most, most scholars, again, believe that this act of sacrilege was what Daniel was probably referring to. This sacrilegious act actually helped spark what became known as the Maccabean Revolt by the Jews. And it was during that Maccabean Revolt against all the odds that there is this season that the Jews actually have had their only period of kind of political self-rule uh, between 586, when the Old Testament, when the Jews were taken captive, 586, all the way to the establishment of uh, the state of Israel in 1948. So all the way from 586 B.C. to 1948, uh, when the state of Israel was established again, the only period of time in that centuries and centuries of time uh, that the Jews were kind of self-ruled uh, was during this, during this Maccabean revolt, and it lasted for around 100 years. And that was sparked primarily um, by this act of sacrilege. And so Daniel used that phrase. It seems to have at least been partially fulfilled uh, during that time. And then this same phrase pops up in Mark 13. And it points forward to some type of equally outrageous and blasphemous event that will take place in the future. And there is a lot of opinions on what that is. Like scholars have a lot of opinions on actually what took place, this act of blasphemy. Has it happened? Will it still happen? There's a couple of similar type events that happened in the decades following uh, when Jesus spoke these words. Uh, most scholars who are kind of of the same persuasion that I would be, um, they, refer, they, they believe that this is actually a prophecy of what will happen at the end of time. Uh, Paul refers to this in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, 
Here Paul says, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the, look at this phrase, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Paul's talking about what, again, most kind of end-time scholars would refer to as the end of time, this antichrist figure who will arise. You've heard of the antichrist. Um, he'll arise. The man of lawlessness is what Paul calls, here, calls him here in 2 Thessalonians. And if that is... If that is the option that is correct, if it is this end of times, antichrist figure, uh, this man of lawlessness, then Jesus is referring here to the rise of this antichrist who will unleash, if you read, if you read kind of what's going to happen at the end of time, he will unleash this severe tribulation on God's people and this will usher in the second coming of Christ, that that would be the final fulfillment of this prophecy. Okay, so this phrase Abomination of desolation um, refers, and it could be both, right? It could be that kind of these acts of blasphemy that happened in the years following the time of Christ, and that, that could have been pointing forward to this final time when the Antichrist will usher in what we call the Great Tribulation. Again, prophecy happens in stages. Now, the language here, it does point to this kind of immediate fulfillment. Jesus says these things are going to happen in Judea. Like these the things are right around the corner. You're going to see them. You're going to hear them. And many of these events took place in 70 A.D., the d- destruction of Jerusalem, the devastation of the temple by this Roman emperor Titus. And so there was some fulfillment that happened um, in the next few def- decades. But biblical prophecy happening in stages, we believe the immediate fulfillment points to a final fulfillment. For instance, this next section, after we get past this abomination of desolation, it does use language here, it employs language that seems to point primarily to the final great tribulation. So let's um, drill down in 19. I know, like, you got to stay with me through this. This is some tough waiting. We'll get through it, I promise. Some of you are, like, on the edge of your seat, like, yay, end time stuff. Some of you are like, oh, my, why did I show up today? I get it, right? Let's stay in it. Stay with the text, and we'll, we'll bring this full circle, I promise you. Uh, 19, in those days, so notice that phrase. I mentioned this last week. Um, Jesus uses kind of this these things language earlier, which seems to be pointing to an immediate future. 19, he kind of transitions into this, in those days, uh, referring perhaps to the end of time. In those days, there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And so that seems to fit the description in the book of Revelation of the Great Tribulation. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. Be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. So what would take place in 70 A.D., these things points forward to the time of the Great Tribulation, those things just prior to the return of the Son of Man, of Jesus. This section of Mark 13 is patterned heavily after Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel 12, the archangel Michael warns of what awaits God's chosen people at the end of time. And what we read in that text is it is a a period, and in this text it's a period unlike any other in human history. As a matter of fact, this text says it is a time that is humanly unsurvivable outside of God's intervention. That humans can't even survive, the text says, outside of God intervening. It is a time that is marked by catastrophic events and deep deception. And here's how Jesus speaks into that. He says, pay attention. Be on guard. He instructs his followers. Awareness and watchfulness. Listen, awareness and watchfulness in the now, in the present, is a mark of faithfulness. It is a mark of perseverance. 
We are to live as followers of Jesus with a posture of readiness and awareness. Now, let's talk for a minute. We are not to live with a, I'll just call it spiritual chicken little mindset. Remember the story of chicken little? Gets hit in the head with an acorn and runs around everybody saying what? Sky is falling. I like your chicken little voices, whoever did that. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Was the sky falling? No, it's got hit in the head with an acorn. We are not to be spiritual chicken littles running around saying the sky is falling. The sky is falling. As a matter of fact, Jesus in this text and others, Paul multiple times warns against the sky is falling mindset. Did you know that the reason that Paul prim- predominantly wrote his letters to the Thessalonian churches, the first and particularly second Thessalonians, was because there was a lot of chicken little Christianity going on. Sky is falling, the sky is falling, second coming of Christ is here. Like, I don't even need to work a job because Jesus is coming back. And Paul addresses those things. And he says that we're not to adopt a mindset of the sky is falling. We're not to have a mentality that the sky is falling. So I want to speak to all of us who claim the name of Jesus to say it is not our calling to try and figure out the how and the when and the where of the end times. Like, don't give in or buy in to kind of the apocalyptic fervor that you find sometimes in Christian circles. That every natural disaster is, you know, the end is here. That everything that happens is somehow the mark of the beast, right? I mean, I could just, I mean, I could have a list of hundreds of things that I have heard since I was a child growing up in church that people have attributed to the mark of the beast. Are you with me? Like, this is coming down the pipeline. Must be the mark of the beast. Um, you're going to have to you're going to have to log into Amazon. Man, that's a that's a sign of the mark of the beast. Right? Man, I was thinking about buying this pair of shoes and suddenly these ads have been popping up on my Facebook. Mark of the beast. Mark of the beast, right? 666 is everywhere. Chicken little spirituality. I remember growing up like even hearing um, certain world leaders if they had six letters in their name, right? There's like Six letters in their first name, six letters in their middle name, six letters last name. Antichrist, Antichrist, 666, there it is, right? There's been millions of dollars made off of numerology and the study of the end times and sensational headlines. And we have to be very cautious, cautious. We are not to lose focus And we're not to focus our attention on speculation and signs, but on obedience and faithfulness in the present, while living with a sense of awareness and urgency. We talked about that last week. You see, speculation regarding the end times can be a distraction. It can be a distraction to gospel living, Gospel growth in my life, serving my community, being a Jesus follower to my neighbors. Like the amount of time that a lot of Christians spend, like down the YouTube wormhole of end times, is frightening at times. The amount of money and resources and energy we give toward trying to figure out stuff that both Jesus and Paul said, stop trying to figure it out, is exhausting at times. Use caution. We want to be aware, right? We want to live with urgency. We want to live in the now, knowing, expecting, hoping, trusting that our King is returning and will establish His kingdom on earth. As a matter of fact, that's where Jesus takes this in the last part of our section this morning, 24. But in those days, right, there's that phrase again referring probably to the end of time. In those days, 
after that tribulation, listen to I me, mean, this is some earth-shattering stuff here. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken, and then they will, what? Then they will see, see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. And so in this text, there's tribulation and suffering and deception and evil and death. And guess what? They do not have the final word. Just when it appears that evil has triumphed to the point, Jesus says in the text of like cosmic chaotic things happening in the heavens themselves. Just when it appears that perhaps evil has somehow won, then, the text says, we will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. The darkness and the chaos give way to King Jesus, and he arrives. These words, again, are taken from Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 7. And they're words of hope, and they are words of triumph. And listen, they are spoken by the one, by the way. They're spoken by the one who is preparing to be humiliated, to be mistreated, to be nailed to a cross like a criminal. And he speaks these words. This one. Who is about to be crucified and murdered says, There's coming a day. There's coming a day when the Son of Man will be raised from the dead, and in great power and glory, he will return and gather his people from every corner of the globe and establish his kingdom on earth. And this is why we are not to live consumed with the hows and the winds and the whats. Instead, we are to be consumed and focused on the who. The one who is coming again in power and glory to claim his own. And in him, in Jesus, we have hope and we have confidence, and we have assurance that the victory is ours because the victory is His. And when we are focused on the details and the wins and the what's and trying to figure it all out, we are losing sight of the who. We are losing sight of the one. We are losing sight of the one who will return with great power and glory and gather His people to Him. We will see Him. We will see him. And by the way, the whole world will see him. And Paul says, the whole world will see him. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is the King of kings. And this hope that we have in his return, enables us to endure the affliction and the brokenness and the evil of this present world. How's this all going to pan out? I don't know. Are we still here when the Great Tribulation happens? Don't know. I mean, there's speculation on both sides. Seems to be indicators that at least during the some periods that may, we may be here, we may not, right? At the end of the day, that's not what we get our eyes on. We don't get our eyes on are we pre or post or ah or all these language that we put around it. What we keep our eyes on is focused on Jesus who is returning and we live with an alertness and an awareness about us that dictates, right, how we walk in our everyday life that is, is, in, is informing our daily walk with Him toward faithfulness and perseverance and keeping our eyes on Him. Look, I get it. I get this fascinating stuff to study, right? I've given some energy in my life to studying these type things too to try to hammer out exactly what I believe. I'm not criticizing like spending some quality try- time trying to understand. There's a lot of apocalyptic literature in the Scriptures. So we read it, we seek to interpret it, 
But I'm telling you in that process as we keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Keep our eyes focused on Him. We do not live as people controlled by fear. We do not live as people controlled by uncertainty. We live as people who are filled with hope, not because of our ability to endure to the end, regardless if we go through all this or not, but because of His ability, because He has endured on our behalf. Our call to perseverance and to endure and to cling and to stay firm in the faith is grounded in the author and finisher of our faith, who the Hebrew writer says, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame. And He is seated at the right hand of God. And the Scripture says in that text, keep your eyes on the author and finisher of your faith. He started it. He will finish it. Keep your eyes on him. <laughs> I don't know what to do when someone claps. Come on. <laughs> Let's go. We're going to end with this. 1 Thessalonians 4. I told you Paul wrote these books about. A lot of this has to do with end time stuff. Let's just read this text together and we'll be done. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. Okay, so there's, let me put this a little bit in context. There are all these questions about if Jesus is coming, what about the people who have died, right? They're Christ followers, but they've died. What, what's going to happen with them? So there's a lot of questions around that question. I do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope, right? So right out of the gate, Paul says, look, we we grieve differently because we're people of hope. 14, for since, and look how he grounds this in the gospel, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. So this, this is the foundation he's building on. Since we believe, right? Jesus died and rose again. So Paul says, everything I'm about to say about end times, people have died prior to Christ, I'm grounding all of this on what we believe about Jesus, about the gospel. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. Because of that, even so, through Jesus, because we believe Jesus died and rose again, we believe God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. So Paul's like, I got this from the Lord Himself. That we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. I think I've been in some of those churches that that verse is applying to. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. That's a joke, people. (laughs) Seventeenth. Then we who are alive, who are left, right? No timelines here, no charts, no this is when it's going to take place, no when you see the earthquakes going on in the, the eastern part of the world, no hey when the tsunami hits, hey when, you, when this guy comes along and he's asking you to put a chip in your hand, right? There's no, none of that speculation here. Those who are alive, who are left, they will be caught up together with Him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then listen, how this grounds us. So we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, therefore, go write a bunch of charts to try to lay this out. No, go speculate on when these things are going to take place. No, go start chicken littling around the world and declaring that the sky is falling. No. What does Paul say? In light of all this, and this, by the way, is one of his most pointed texts on the return of Christ. He says, therefore, in light of everything I've just said, in light of the gospel, in light of the fact that Jesus is returning, in light of the one that he's going to make this happen, in light of the the idea that something's going to happen, he's coming, we're going to be gathered to him. Therefore, in light of all these things, do what? Encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another. Encourage each other. We don't run around, right? 
We don't run around with all this apocalyptic speculation. What do we do? This hits us in the everyday of living as Jesus followers, that we are grounded in the gospel of Christ, believing that he's going to return. We don't know exactly how and when and how all those things are going to spell out. But in the meantime, what we are to do is lift each other up, encourage each other on the journey. Hang in there. Stand firm. Persevere. He's the author. He's the finisher. Keep your eyes on Jesus. We don't know how all this is going to happen, but be encouraged. Lift up your eyes, Jesus follower, and keep them on Jesus. He's coming back. It's guaranteed he's coming back. Our hope is in him. Our confidence is in him. Our assurance is in him. So get your eyes up. Be encouraged that he's got this. Don't worry about the brokenness. Don't worry about the struggles. Don't worry about the suffering, the tribulation. Those things are real. Those things hurt, right? Those things create pain and doubts and questions. In those moments, in those moments, be encouraged. Get your eyes up. Get your eyes up. Be encouraged that he's got this. He wins in the end. And because he wins in the end, we win in the end. So be encouraged, Jesus follower. Be encouraged. We are his people. We are his people. We are servants of a king. We are not alarmist. We are servants of a king who is returning to gather his people from every corner of the globe to live eternally with him. That's why I tell you again and again here at City Church, I don't want you walking out these doors on Sunday mornings afraid of the world out there that is awaiting you and afraid to step into it and constantly trying to pull out of it and constantly trying to figure things out. I want you to walk out of these doors with the confidence that he's got this and we're following him. We serve him. And no matter what happens, no matter the suffering, the pain, the persecution, we can trust because he is the author and finisher of our faith. So don't live afraid. Don't live as an alarmist. Don't live concerned about how it's all going to pan out. Live with the confidence that we are his children and we, he is our king and he will gather us one day, whenever that is, he will gather us one day and his kingdom will be established and we will live with him as our king for all eternity. We said it last week, we live with expectation we live with endurance, we live with empathy in the world in which God has placed us, and we live with gospel engagement, telling others about this coming king, this good news of a king who has come to rescue our sinful soul. So I don't have Mark 13 figured out. I don't. Jesus says some stuff here that causes me to scratch my head. So what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to focus my attention on the one who endured the cross, was raised from the dead, and is coming back again. And I'm going to trust and believe that he is king. And I will follow him. It's tough at times. There's persecution. There's suffering. There's brokenness. Sometimes it looks like evil's triumphed, right? Let's be honest. And we can allow that to discourage us or get us down, or we can lift our eyes to the author and finisher of our faith and rest and trust in him.